Hi gang, Jeff McAleer here, and my travels have brought me to Mount Vernon, Washington, which happens to be just north of Renton, Washington, which is the headquarters of Wizards of the Coast. And speaking of Wizards of the Coast, on this review, I'm taking a look at Dungeon Command, the new Dungeons and Dragons skirmish miniatures game. So let's take a peek. So let's see what we've got in the box for Dungeon Command. And we're going to use Heart of Cormier as an example. There are three sets that are currently available. Heart of Cormier, Sting of Loth, and Tyranny of Goblins. But as an example, let's just take a look at this first set. And we begin with uh, some advertising for D&D. Prepare yourself for the Rise of the Underdark. Then we have the rule book. And the rule book is about 14 pages, I believe. Let's jump back here. 15 pages. And, as you can see, it's very lavishly illustrated. Lots of examples of play that are included as well. From reading through the rules, everything is pretty straightforward. There aren't a lot of head scratchers. I think on a couple of occasions I had to stop to uh, just reread an item. Then we have the commander cards, and each set contains two of the commander cards. Each card shows the name of the hero, what special skill they have, the size of their creature hand that they have each turn, the starting number of order cards they have in their hand, as well as morale and leadership. There are two ways to win a game of Dungeon Command. One is to reduce your opponent's morale to zero or your opponent no longer has any creatures on the board. Also you have leadership and with leadership that's the total level of creatures that you can have in play. So we have the two different heroes we also have terrain tiles. There are large terrain and small terrain tiles. And one's a dungeon setup, the other is a wilderness setup. And there's various different terrain on these tiles as well. So we have two large and two small. There's also a deck of cards. There's two decks in reality, but they're packaged together as one deck. You have order cards, and you also have creature cards, and we'll take a look at those as we get into the gameplay. We also have the miniatures, and each box contains 12 miniatures. For the most part, it's one large, 10 medium, one small. Although I do believe in Tyranny of Goblins there are two larger figures. The sculpts are pretty nice and the paint job overall isn't too bad on most of them. Although I will point out there are a few that uh, well they're pre-paints what can you say? You're gonna expect that some of the paint jobs aren't going to be the best. And I'll use this figure as an example here. What, you don't get eyes? What, are you blind? What's going on here? One thing I noticed too is on the included dragon, which was a bit of a bummer, you can see it is missing some paint right along here. Uh, well, what can you say? They are pre-paints. 
The price point for Dungeon Command for each of the faction boxes is, if memory serves me correctly, $39.95. So, getting 12 miniatures, you're looking at about $3.33 per mini. So, it's a pretty good deal as far as the miniatures that you get for the price. Now, if we lift this up, we're also going to find we have various counters and many are used to track hit point damage there are some treasures some special items and so forth so these come into play as well so that's what we have in the box now nothing so let's take a look at the gameplay of dungeon command to begin I've set up using components that are available in the Heart of Cormier as well as the Sting of Lolth faction packs. And I will point out that this is very convoluted here. Normally these cards would all be off to the side, but I have kind of included them in just to keep them in frame so we can kind of take a look at all the various different components in action as far as the gameplay. There's two things I'll point out before we get into the actual gameplay of Dungeon Command. And first off, you're going to notice there are no dice. When we were unboxing the game, there are no dice included. This is a diceless D&D game. And I know for a lot of people, that almost sounds like blasphemy. But everything is done without dice. It's all card-driven as well as uh, standard attacks do a set amount of damage depending on the creature. Something else I wanted to mention is that the miniatures that are included in the game can also be plugged into the other Dungeons & Dragons adventure games like Legend of Drizzt, Castle Ravenloft, and Wrath of Ashardalon. And each faction pack includes some cards. Take a closer look at these that you'll be able to utilize in those adventure games. So, an added bonus for picking up the faction packs. Pretty cool. Although I do have to point out that the reality is you're probably going to see a lot more use from the monsters as opposed to some of the uh, adventurers and so forth in those other games because the monsters come up much more than the NPCs do. Each game will begin with each player choosing a commander and each of the faction packs come with two commanders. Here we're going to have Valnar Trueblade, the good guy, versus Alessandra Malastros. Hey, that's a guess. Come on, it's a D&D &D name. Give me a break. With Valnar, his morale starts at 14, his leadership is 7, his beginning creature hand is 3, and his starting order hand is 4. His special skill is versatile, so each adventurer you control can use a standard action to move up to its speed. And we'll take a look at some of the creature cards to show you exactly some of the classifications that they have. For Alessandra, or whatever, her morale is 13, leadership 7, creature hand is 4, and starting order hand is 5. So the morale is a little bit lower, but she starts with more order cards in her hand. Each player has a deck of order cards, and there are 36 cards included in each faction pack. Each player must have at least 30 cards in their deck, so there's a little bit of deck tuning involved in Dungeon Command. And they have various different effects. Some are standard, some are immediate. Some help you add more damage to your attacks. Some allow you to avoid damage. Others are special magical attacks, so on and so forth. So taking a look at, let's say, this first card here, Disrupting Attack. It's a level 2 card. It's a standard order. And your melee attack does an additional 10 points of damage. And if the target takes that damage, it's tapped and the target's controller has to discard one of their order cards in hand. Use another example. Invigorating Smash. 
That sounds interesting. It's a level 4 card. It has a strength category and make a melee attack that deals 50 damage. And the creature that makes the attack heals 20 damage. You'll notice each of the cards have a level. They may also have a defining attribute that has to be on the card as well for the creature. And we'll take a look at that as well. So for an example, you must have level 4 creature and have the strength on the creature card to be able to utilize this order. But there's some ways of getting around having that level cap too, so I'll point that out as well. So for an example, Valner Trueblade would start the game, would have four order cards in hand. One, two, three, four. And you would have that put to the side. And of course you're able to take a look at your cards as well. So we'll just, as an example. You also have a creature hand. So you have creature cards that will come into play as well. You can't just bring any monsters or adventurers you want onto the table whenever you feel like it. It's important to point out Dungeon Command is a pretty light skirmish game. So you'll have these creature cards. So Valner Trueblade gets to begin the game with three creature cards in hand. So one, two, three. And, they, and he always has three creature cards in hand. So you'll, at the end of the turn, you get to draw more creatures to put in your hand. So as an example, I've already brought some creatures out onto the board for the sake of saving some time. So let's look at the creature cards themselves. And as an example, let's take a look at the Earth Guardian. The Earth Guardian is a level 4 elemental earth. He does have that strength classification. We look here, he does 30 points of melee damage. He has two special skills. One is Burrow, which is a method of movement, and the other is Slam. Whenever an adjacent creature takes damage from this creature's attack, slide the damaged creature three squares. We also see he has a speed of six. And there's also a picture of the model for you, too. I know Elliot sometimes has a hard time figuring out which miniature represents what card, so this comes in really handy for him, or folks like him. So I've set up a little bit of a battle, just kind of give you an idea. We have the Earth Guardian, we also have the Dwarf Cleric, and an Elf Archer versus a Drow Priestess, a Drow Houseguard, ooh, and a Giant Spider. Elliot loves spiders. <laughs> Not really. Each turn is broken up into four phases. Refresh, activate, deploy, and clean up. In the first phase, refresh, you'll resolve any of your start of turn effects. So for an example, you may have a card on one of your creatures which deals an additional, let's say, 10 points of damage at the beginning of every turn. You would resolve that effect. You'll also untap all of your creatures. And yes, I did say tap, and it's a Wizards of the Coast game, so that means that you can legally use that term. So when a creature is tapped, you're simply going to take the card and put it sideways. So that just shows that some special effect or order or it's attacked. It just shows that it's already used one of the abilities that it has available to it. You also are able to draw an order card during the refresh phase. One order card, and there's no limit to the number of order cards you can have in your hand, although we will mention a problem with the order cards a little bit later in this gameplay example. The second phase is where almost all of the action is going to take place, and that's activating. You activate all of your creatures, one at a time, and you will perform actions, you'll move, you'll attack, and so forth. Then you have the deployment phase, where you're able to bring creatures up to the level of your leadership, the creature card in hand, and the total of the creatures that you would have in play, including that level, is not exceeded. We have cleanup where you'll resolve end of turn effects. 
you're going to draw back up to your creature hand and all your creatures get untapped. So you're untapping your creatures at the beginning of your turn and at the end of the turn. Let's take a look at an example of the activation phase. So we'll activate Valner's troops here. So we decide we're going to activate the Dwarf Cleric. And we don't like that big spider sitting over here, so let's try to take that out. The Dwarf Cleric has a speed of 5. So he may move 5 squares, and you may move diagonally as well, as long as you're not moving diagonally through a wall or around the corner of a dungeon. One thing I will point out, the terrain on the board has various different clear, difficult, and obstacles. And one thing I think is kind of strange with the outdoor setting here is there's an elevated area where you'll see these count as walls that run around here, yet there's no way for you to move into these squares. You'll notice they're not designated with squares here. Although there are creatures that can fly and burrow. So realistically, you should be able to put creatures up there. But anyway, let's activate the Dwarven Cleric. So his movement is five. So one, two, three, four, five. And we can use him to attack the spider. Now, if we had a card that we wanted to utilize, we could. So taking a look through, we see we've got a power attack which allows you to deal an additional 20 points of damage to the creature. Now, as I mentioned before, there's no dice, so attacks are automatic. So the Dwarf Cleric does 20 points of melee damage, and we could play this as an action, which would tap our Dwarf Cleric. The attack would tap him anyway. So he gets 20 additional points of damage to the spider. Now, in this case, the draw player could decide, well, you know what, I'm going to play a card to maybe negate that damage. But let's say, for an example, they decide they're not going to. They're going to take those, those 40 points total of damage. So we have this giant spider with 60 hit points. Well... Now that giant spider has taken 10, 20, 30, 40 hit points in damage. Not looking good for the spider. So we've now tapped the Dwarf Cleric. He's pretty much done for the turn. So let's activate the Earth Guardian. And he has a speed of 6. So, 1, 2, 3, 4. Four, five, six. So now he's adjacent to the spider so he can attack with a melee attack. Now he does 30 points of melee damage. So with that 30 points he's gonna kill the giant spider with his attack. So making the attack it's 30 points but what's this? The drow player looks through their order cards and finds Hmm, Uncanny Dodge. It's a level 2, and it requires dexterity. Looking at the giant spider, it's level 3, and it has the dexterity. So this action could be played. And what this is, you discard one order card to prevent all damage to this creature from one source. So the draw player wants to keep the spider in the fight, plays this, and then discards a card. So those would go into the discard pile. Of course, Valner player is now sitting there going, damn, I wanted to wipe that spider out. So they still have the elf archer available. They have a speed of seven, but you also have to keep in mind there's line of sight. It's a range of 10 that the elf archer could fire, but the line of sight is blocked by the two allies, but you can move and attack, remember? So we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, 
uh, difficult terrain, or I'm sorry, that is an obstacle. So as you'll notice, this is part of a forest here and it's considered an obstacle, which is difficult terrain, so it's more difficult to move through, but it also blocks line of sight. Once again, no opportunity to get the shot in at the spider, but the elf archer has moved into position for later on in the fight to probably get some shots in, especially if these were to slide over. Thus, at this point, this would end the Valner player's activation. So then they could deploy, and there's a start area that's marked on the board. They could conceivably possibly bring someone in. Now, well, let's take a look. The leadership in this turn, let's say this is the second or third turn of the game. There's level one, level three, level four. Now, for the leadership on your commander, each deploy phase, your leadership goes up one. So it becomes easier to bring more powerful creatures into the fight. So we'd say if it's the second turn, the leadership value for Valner would now be nine. So if there's a creature card in hand, that would be a level one or level two or a combination of two level ones, they could bring those creatures onto the board. Those are pretty much the basics of how the game plays. And of course, the different creatures have, many of them at least, have special abilities, such as for an example, I mentioned the Earth Guardian can burrow. And also they have that slam, which would have helped if they had hit the spider. Let's say they didn't kill the spider, it would still knock the spider back. Where a lot of the fun and chess-like maneuvering of the game coming into play is with the various different order cards and the different abilities. You'll find with two players going at it, you're maneuvering your different forces to get into position to best utilize their special abilities. They can combine together. So for an example, you can assist one of your creatures with other creatures who are adjacent to it to combine their levels together to utilize an order card that might be of a higher level than the actual creature that's making that action or using that order. Where the real issue with the game comes into play, there's a couple. First off, some of the cards may not be as clear as they should be about how to utilize them. It takes a little bit of discussion and some agreement between the players to kind of get on the same page with a few of the cards. But where the problem I see really lies with the game is with these action cards themselves. You only have so many in your hand to start with, and you only draw one card each turn. So it gets to the point where you may blow through your order cards in a particularly hectic turn, and then find that you have no order cards available to you that you can utilize. Maybe you draw an order card that affects a creature that's not on the board or that's already been destroyed and it's out of the game. It's kind of a wasted card. So what eventually takes place as the battle goes on is you find that it becomes a rather repetitive back and forth. The creatures all have standard attacks. So if the Earth Guardian attacks, he's always going to do 30 points of damage unless the other player utilizes a card that's going to eliminate the damage. There is one effect that can be used with any of the creatures and it's called cowering. And this can help you keep your monsters and creatures and adventurers in play because if you decide to cower, for every 10 points of damage that you would be taking from that attack, you can trade off a point of morale. Morale is effectively the currency of the game. So when your morale is zero, game's over. You've lost. But you might find that there's a time when you really do need to trade off morale to eliminate some damage to keep some of the bigger baddies or bigger heroes on the board at least for another turn. All in all, the game plays well up until about the midpoint of the battle. And then when those order cards are gone or you have 
order cards that just don't have any effect on the units you still have available to you, it really does become pretty monotonous. I have a bit of a split decision on the game because, yes, granted, the pre-painted miniatures the sculpts are nice, but the paint jobs are pretty much par for the course for most pre-painted minis. And as you've already seen, the paint jobs aren't real great and they are missing paint on some of the figures. That said, as I said, the sculpts are nice. And the game plays pretty well up until about the midway point while you're approaching the end game. What begins is a pretty entertaining experiment in fantasy skirmish of maneuvering, almost chess-like, to be able to get your forces in position to best utilize their powers and the action cards that you have in hand, or I should say order cards, soon bogs down in the middle of the action because you run out of those order cards. And it just becomes a repetitive back and forth of predetermined damage being dealt out by your units. All in all, for myself, this makes Dungeon Command a pretty mediocre product. It starts out fun and then just boils down into same old, same old. So I can't see a lot of people getting a lot of play out of it because they'll find battle after battle eventually turns into the same back and forth. This isn't to say that it's completely broken and I do believe the design team at Wizards of the Coast will be able to address this. And in my written review, I actually mention a couple of things that can be done, one by wizards and the other by players themselves, to kind of break up that monotony. At the end of the day, if you want to get your hands on some pretty nice sculpts at a very low cost, by all means, run out there and pick up some copies of the various faction packs for Dungeon Command. If you're looking for a really entertaining skirmish game in a fantasy setting that's going to be different every time you play, then at this point in time, I would say steer clear of Dungeon Command. That's it for this time around. Be sure to visit us over at thegaminggang.com for the latest in news, reviews, and opinion. And if you're interested in getting the various different faction packs for Dungeon Command, go to wizards.com slash dnd and you'll be able to find the releases there. Once again, thanks for joining me.